everybody since the time that Alexander the Great founded that city. The Jews had been strong in Alexandria. Their hatred toward Christians was vicious and insane. They killed Christians by treachery, by poisoning, by crucifying them on crosses. After a long and difficult struggle, Cyril succeeded during the reign of Emperor Theodosius the Younger in driving the Jews out of Alexandria. However, his struggle against Nestorius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, was resolved at the Third Ecumenical Council in Ephesus in 431. Cyril himself presided at this council, and at the same time he represented Pope Celestine of Rome at the request of the latter, who was unable to attend the council because of old age. Nestorius was condemned, anathematized, and banished by the emperor on the eastern boundary of the emperor, empire where he died a horrible death. After the completion of the struggle, Cyril lived in peace and zealously tended Christ's flock. He went to the Lord in the year 444. It is said that he composed the prayer for Theotokos and Virgin to rejoice. St. Cyril of White Lake. Cyril was of an aristocratic family and was born and educated in Moscow. He was tonsured a monk in a seminal monastery where he lived a life of asceticism that amazed the other monks. In order to conceal his virtues, he pretended insanity. He personally spoke with St. Sergius of Radhanas and received many beneficial instructions from him. Against his will, he was elected abbot of the monastery. He prayed constantly to the all-holy Theotokos to show him the way whereby he could live a life of asceticism in silence. <coughs> One night, he saw a great light and heard a voice, Cyril, depart from here and go to White Lake. And indeed, he departed from Simonov Monastery with one companion, went to the vicinity of White Lake, and there in the dense pine forest began to live a sight of light of asceticism. In time, this hermitage was transformed into a large monastery. The venerable Cyril received the great gift of miracle working from God. He cured the sick, worked many other miracles. He died in the year 1429 in his 90th year and took up his habitation with the Lord, whom he had ardently loved his entire life. Scion of the most powerful family in the north of Ireland, founder of monasteries and instigator of missions to the Greeks and the English, Columba is undoubtedly the most important saint associated with Celtic churches. Columba was born in Royal Scot around 521 in northwestern Ireland's Don Donegal. Although destined for the church by an early age, his noble birth gave him insight and influence over the political world. Legend tells us that his original name was Quintan, which means fox, and that when he was trained as a priest, he changed it to Colum, which means dove, later known as Columbia, dove of the church. It has become something of a tradition in modern times to view the saint through the twin lenses of these names, the astute fox of the monks and the peacemaking and peaceable dove. He apparently took part in, in a battle in 561 between his near and more distant cousins. This led to his exile and even excommunication for a time. Yet his biographer and successor, Agamemnon, saw it differently, glossing over his excommunication and telling us only that in the second year following the Battle of Pul Gebne, when he was 41, Columba sailed away from Ireland to Britain choosing to be a pilgrim for Christ. Despite the skeletons in Columbus closet, his efforts in Scotland reveal a man who had learned much in his 41 years, enough to establish a string of monasteries in the inner Hebridean, Hebridean, Hebridean um, islands off the coast of Scotland. <coughs> this was monastic system 
anticipated later orders such as the Cistercians and Carthusians. Iona, a small island off the large Hebridean island of Mo, was the fertile center of this system. Remote to modernized Iona was the hub of early medieval sea lanes that brought pottery and perishable goods north from France and the Mediterranean. Still, Iona was intended as a true monastery, a place set apart for Columba and his brethren. Other island monasteries, such as the one in Tybee, housed lay folk serving out penances for their sins. Another island housed older, more experienced monks living as holy anchorites. Iona, however, trained priests and bishops, and Columba's reputation for scholarship was great when he died, though we have little of his own work. From Iona, priests and monks ranged far and wide, founding churches in Scotland and seeking, quote, deserts in the ocean lonely, distant islands. Monk Columbus' legends give us flavor of both the fox and the dove. The Life of Columba by Adonan is packed with stories about Columba conversing with angels, sending an angel to rescue a monk falling from a roof, and being whipped by an angel to convince him to ordain gods rather than his own choice for the king of the Gaelic colony in Scotland. He is seen wrapped in contemplation, seeing what with a, mound, with a mind miraculously enlarged, the entire orbit of the whole earth and the sea and the sky around it, unquote. From these visions, he proclaimed prophecies <coughs> sent monks to help distressed people or praise to refresh his tired monks laboring in the fields. Columba holds his own with kings. Though he prays for the military success of kings whom God has chosen, he argues with angels over their appointments. He faces down the king of Picts through his power, blasting him with loud songs, throwing wide his strong oak doors, and besting the magic of the king's druids. He even defeats wild animals, a fierce boar drops dead on the spot, and a strange monster of darkness <coughs> runs from his power. One particular appearance decades after his death to the English king of Northumbria was pivotal in the history of Christianity in Britain. That king was Oswald, who had been raised in exile in Iona. As Oswald fought the battle in which he secured his kingship, Columba towered above the field, promising victory, as one modern scholar puts it, quote, like Batman over Gotham. In, in 635, Oswald sent four missionaries from Iona to renew the flagging Christianity of Northumbria with their monastic sobriety and good works. Columbo was a poet, scholar of wide learning, monastic founder and leader, a visionary churchman. At the time of his death, on June 9, 597, he was already celebrated. Though more monk than missionary, Columba established churches in Scotland that went on in time to evangelize the Picts and the English. The legacy of the monasteries he founded which drew constantly on the inspiration of their patron saint, multiplies many times the influence of the man himself. Fittingly, at the end of his life, Adamnan has his hero ascend the little hill near the monastery on Iona and declare, quote, this place, however small and mean, will have bestowed on it no small but great honor but by the kings and the peoples of Ireland and also by the rulers and even barbarous foreign nations with their subject tribes, and the saints of other churches, too, will give it great reverence. Blessed is our God, always, now, and ever, and on to the ages of ages. Amen. Come, bless us.
Let us worship and fall down before God our King. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ our King and our God. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ himself, our King and our God. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who has stretched out the heavens like a tent, who has laid the beams of thy chambers on the waters, who makes the clouds thy chariot, who rides on the wings of the wind, who makes the winds thy messenger, fire and flame thy ministers. Thou didst set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be shaken. Thou didst cover it with the deep as with a garment, the waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled, at the sound of thy thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which thou didst appoint for them. Thou didst set a bound which they should not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. Thou makest springs gush forth in the valleys, they flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field, the wild asses quench their thirst. By them the birds of the air have their habitation, they sing among the branches. From thy lofty abode thou waterest the mountains, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy work. Thou dost cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted. In them the birds build their nests, their stoke, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the badgers. Thou hast made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun knows its time for setting. Thou makest darkness, and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep forth. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they get them away and lie down in their dens. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works, and wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, which teems with things innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which thou hast formed to sport in it. These all look to thee to give them their food in due season. When thou givest to them, they gather it up. When thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good things. When thou hidest thy face, they are dismayed. When thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. The sun knows its time for setting. Thou makest darkness and it is night. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Alleluia, 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 glory to the O God. Alleluia, 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 glory to the O God. Alleluia, 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 glory to the O God. O our God and our hope, glory to thee. Let's pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the good estate of the holy churches of God, and for the union of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for those with faith, reverence and the fear of God enter therein. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our Father, Metropolitan Joseph and our Bishop Anthony, the honorable priest of the diaconate in Christ, for all the clergy and the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the President of the United States and all civil authorities, and our armed forces everywhere, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the
the city of Bloomington, for every city and countryside, and for the faithful who dwell therein, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For healthful seasons, abundance of the fruits of the earth, and peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For travelers by sea, by land, and by air, for the sick and the suffering, for captives and their salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our deliverance from all tribulation, wrath, danger, and necessity, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help us, save us, have mercy on us. And keep us, O God, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. Calling to remembrance our all holy, immaculate, most blessed, and glorious lady, the most beautiful of all the saints. Let us commend ourselves and each other in all our life unto Christ our God. For unto thee do all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. O Lord, I have cried out unto thee, hear the
Tell unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are strong and high. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall wait for me until thou recompense me. Out of the depths of my cry unto thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let thy ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Thou, Lord, just mark it, the Lord, who shall stand, for with thee there is forgiveness. Having accomplished salvation for all mankind, thou, O Christ, didst make the way upon Mount Olivet, whence thou wast taken up in the sight of thy disciples, Born up in glory to heaven from earth, wherefore sore astonished as they saw the mystery, the lower orders then cried aloud to those above them, Lift ye up the gates, and our God, the King of all, shall enter, and went he before went out, even as it was well pleasing in his sight. While most wondrously working full salvation for the world in time. Because of thy name have I waited for thee, O Lord. My soul hath waited upon thy word, my soul hath hoped in the Lord. As the whole choir of disciples saw thee taken up on high, O Master, they said, Where dost thou depart now from thy servants? Where goest thou, O thou that holdest the farthest parts? of creation in thy hands. We have gladly left all things to follow after thee, our God, while hoping to be with thee unto the ages. Do not forsake us as orphans comfortless, O our good Father, most compassionate, even as thou hast promised, send unto us thy good comforter spirit and the sovereign Savior of our souls. From the morning watch until night, from the morning watch, let Israel trust in the Lord. As thou wast giving thy friends a final blessing, thou didst then initiate them into mysteries. Behold, I go to my Father now, O my beloved friends, but I shall send you another comforter. And O Master, thou didst say, I never shall forsake the sheep I gathered. Those whom I love I shall not forget, but once endued with divine power from on high, then go ye forth and preach unto all the world. Go your ways to all nations and every tribe, and proclaim the good tidings of salvation that is come to all. For with the Lord there is mercy with him as abundant redemption, and he will deliver Israel from all his iniquities. Since thy mind shall be splendidly with the Spirit's clear beacon light, thou thyself became as the bright beaming sun, as shining rays pouring forth thy saving darkness throughout the earth, making all the companies of the faithful exceeding bright, driving off the gloom of the heresies of the mighty strength of him who shone forth from the virgin, God bearing cereal, most blessed our God. Praise the Lord, all nations, praise him, all ye peoples. With the eloquence of thy words, all the church is made beautiful, almost sacred cereal, and with great reverence. She doth rejoice in my doctrines as in beautiful ornaments, and doth honor sacredly thine auspicious and holy feast. O most glorious, thou dost boast of the thou great boast of the Orthodox, and leader of the fathers of the council, the holy virgin's brave champion. For his mercy is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. In thy doctrines, which breathe with fire, all the substance of heresies is burnt up like sticks in the flame. O man most wise, the host of godless and disobedient foes, 
Drowneth in the depths of thy knowledge and thy thoughts. But the church of the faithful is ever arrayed with thy doctrines of wisdom. O oh, blessed Cyril, as he crieth with a great voice and giveth honor and praise to thee. Peace 
and repentance, let us ask of the Lord. And this for good. Christian, and into our life, painless, blameless, and peaceful, and a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ, let us ask of the Lord. And this for good. Calling to remembrance are all holy, immaculate, and blessed and glorious Lady Hilda, Mary, with all the saints. Let us commend ourselves and each other in all our life unto Christ our God. Amen. Thou art a good God and lovest mankind, and unto thee we ascribe glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Peace be to all. Let us bow our heads unto the Lord. To the Lord. O Lord our God, who didst bow the heavens and come down for the salvation of mankind, look upon thy servants and upon thine inheritance. For unto thee, the awesome judge, who lovest mankind, have thy servants bow their heads and submissively incline to their necks, awaiting not help from men, but entreating thy mercy and looking confidently for thy salvation. Guard them at all times, both during this present evening and in the approaching night, from every enemy, from all adverse powers of the devil, from vain thoughts and from evil imaginations. Blessed and glorified be the majesty of thy kingdom, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. when they saw that it 
was their own master. They were commanded to lift up the heavenly gates. With them we ceaselessly praise thee, who again shall come from thence in the flesh as the judge of all and almighty God. Lord, now let us tell thy servant to part in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O all holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thou hast ascended in glory, O Christ our God. And glad in thy disciples with the promise of the Holy Spirit, having become confident of the blessing, verily thou art the Son of God and deliverer of the world. Have mercy upon us, O God, according to thy great mercy, we pray thee, hearken and have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Again we pray for all pious and orthodox Christians. Again we pray for our Father, Metropolitan Joseph, and our Bishop Anthony. Again, we pray for our brethren, the priests, deacons, and monastics, and for all our brotherhood in Christ. Senor Tempieta, Senor Tempieta, Senor Tempieta. Again, we pray for mercy, life, peace, health, salvation, visitation, pardon, and remission of sins for the servants of God, the priests Basil and Rodney, our deacon Lawrence and Marcia. Perpetua, Don, Guy, Anna, Michael, Olga, Eileen, Sora, and Serafima, Allison, Marvin, Stephen, Anna, Xenia, Faith, Alicia, Marianne, Thomas, Vicky, Olga, Daniel, and Nora, for Hermione and the child she bears, Mother Galina, Matushka, Raisa, the more and happy missionary families, for Emma, George, Kirby, Janet, Pam, Jeff, Nelson, Andrew, Penny, Theodora, and David, for the servants of God suffering the war in Ukraine, the catechumens and inquirers of the Holy Orthodox faith especially, Ken, Kenny, Ian, Ian, Wyatt, Rebecca, Michael, Michael, Zephaniah, Elias, Jacob, Rick, Emma, David, Heather, James, Nicholas, and Alice, Justin, Jeremy, Stephen, Ashley, and Evelyn, Tim and Christina and family, Timothy, Philip, Pauline, Kelsey, Tim and Sue, Hayden and Emery, and for all Orthodox Christians of true worship who live and dwell in this community. Again, we pray for the blessed and ever memorable founders of this holy temple, for the servants of God, the newly departed, Metropolitan Ilarion, 
Lavinia, Joan, Jim, Helen, and Stephen, and for all our fathers and brethren, the Orthodox departed the sight before us, appeared in all the world, lie asleep in the Lord. Again, we pray for those who bear fruit and do good works in this holy and honorable temple, for those who serve and those who sing, and for all the people here present who await thy great and rich mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. With our merciful God, who loveth mankind, and unto the do we ascribe glory, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Wisdom. Amen. Christ our God, the existing one is blessed, always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. You've heard we're still in this season of the Ascension, which we will celebrate until we come to Pentecost this coming weekend. The hymns were all about the Ascension. The, if you noticed, uh, the repeated, the repeated celebration, if you will, that uh, God raised us up and is seated at the right hand of the Father on high, that his humanity and his divinity are there seated at the right hand of God, that he has raised us up. It said, on the throne together with him at the Father's right hand. It's just this repeated assertion, celebration, confession. And uh, I suspect that the meaning of that probably matures with us as we mature in our spiritual life. Um, for us to wrap our mind around, around what that means, that there's a man seated in heaven who is like us, that there is a human being 
and throne at the right hand of God the Father. That we who had corrupted our flesh, who through sin have brought corruption and sickness and death into the world, misery into creation, that God became incarnate for us. He loved us so much that he came to live, to be like us, and to suffer and to die, to rise again on the third day, and then to ascend on high, bringing our bodies together with him to the right hand of the Father. We are in Christ, and he has ascended in glory. And he will come again in the same way as we have seen him go. And remember that line from the feast, from the reading of the gospel. So I know you heard it repeated tonight many times <clears throat> in the hymns. It's something we're very much supposed to be entering into and to be celebrating. And, um, and again, as they talk about the ascension, there's always that foreshadowing, the coming of the comforter. So we are in that period of anticipation now. So may God grant us to grow in our understanding and experience of what it means that Christ, fully God and fully man, has ascended on high and has raised us up to this place at the right hand of God the Father on the throne. It's a, it's a great mystery that um, we can try to begin to, to, to think about, to comprehend, to contemplate. Uh, but I think it, it requires God revealing it to us to understand it in its fullness and its beauty, what it means that we're there. So God bless you and each of us as we continue in this time of preparation for Pentecost. Uh, tonight is Ask Abuna, and so we have 10 minutes if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, but I'm happy to try and answer them. Ken. Um, I wanted to ask why we say the Lord's Prayer differently than many other churches. Is it a matter of translation or tradition or what? I'm talking about the evil one rather than right. the evil. So, so that um, is literally, if we said it the way that we should, which eventually we will, Excuse me, could you repeat Ken's question? Sure. For the people at home who can't hear and anybody else who can't hear, why is our translation of the Lord's Prayer different than many other people's translations? Specifically saying the evil one instead of deliver us from evil. Um, that's a great question. So what we've basically done in orthodoxy up until recently is borrowed uh, the West's translation of the um, of the Lord's Prayer because it's easy and it's what everybody says and it, we can just you know everybody can say it along with us and but what's happened is that uh, as orthodoxy has continued to mature in this country some translators have said you know what we should really make this translation reflect what the Greek actually says rather than just kind of going along to get along we should really retranslate this in such a way that it actually ref reflects what the Greek says. And so in our translation, we've done that once, there will be other tweaks as orthodoxy continues to come together in America in its translation pro uh, process so that we can all, you can go to a Greek church or a Russian church or an Antiochian church, etc., and everybody will have the same translation. That's the idea that we'll get to eventually, that everybody will have the proper translation and that we'll be able to say, say it together. That's not the case. The translations are a little different. Even the Nicene Creed, it's the same thing. Uh, there are these little tweaks. And so the Greek, uh, the, the Greek literally says uh, the evil one. We translate it as evil uh, in, in, in general in, in the English translations of the Lord's Prayer typically. But we're referring to the evil one and his minions, not just some force out there, some dark force but we're talking about a particular angel and his minions, the evil one and his demons. Another uh, tweak would be, our Father who art in heaven. It actually literally says, um, who art in the heavens. It's, it's plural. 
Um, and so some of those changes will eventually, th th those changes will continue to be made um, and, and, and we can be all on the same page. I don't know if that's even going to happen in my lifetime, I, to be honest with you, I have no idea. We were given about 10 years ago, not quite 10, but close, we were given a new translation of the Nicene Creed um, that is the new translation that will be used by all Orthodox Christians in America everywhere. But we're not using it yet. <laughs> so th these things take time. I have the book with the new translation, and it's all correct. It's proper, you know. It's but we're, everybody says the one that we know that we have memorized. And until everybody has that card in their hand, and we are given the green light from the Metropolitan to March fourth with that translation, we'll still say the one that we've we've been saying. Okay. Good question. Really good question. <laughs> Anna Noor. How old was Saint John the Baptist when he died? Saint John the Baptist, I believe he was. 30, 30, probably 30, 29 or 30. He was older than Jesus, wasn't he? Six months. Okay. So Jesus began his earthly okay, ministry. So was early yeah. then. All right. Yeah. Good question. Nicholas, you always have good questions. Yeah. And this one too says, and they put St. Nicholas on the front on the altar. Why is that? They put St. Nicholas on the front of the altar? Is that what you mean? Yes, on the side. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So St. Nicholas, on our iconostasis, he's here. Where would he be in the some of the other churches you've been to? The same place. Oh, that's a great question. For another place. For another place. Or another. He also could be right next to the Theotokos if it's a St. Nicholas church. That's right. So if it's a St. Nicholas Orthodox church, then he would be right here, because this is the All Saints icon, because we're All Saints Orthodox Church. So to the right of the Theotokos always goes the patron saint of the church. Now, St. Nicholas often appears on iconostases. If you have one that's big enough that can have extra icons like ours, then you choose icons that are meaningful to your community. So St. Nicholas is an example of a saint who's widely recognized, everybody knows who St. Nicholas is, right? He's the patron saint of a lot of people and a lot of things, and uh, he's widely loved. Did you know, by the way, you know those big, huge cruise ships go on? You ever seen those things? They're huge. They're like a city. They're white, usually. And they have like a million win little round windows in them. And anyway, and one time uh, I lived in, when I lived up in Juneau, Alaska, it was, uh, uh, it was a, a port for those cruise ships. And so the cruise ships would come in, and all the people would get off, and this, this town of 30,000 people would be filled with, I think we had half a million cruise ship passengers come through there every summer, right? So it was, our little town took on a lot of people. And uh, one day, I made friends with somebody who was an entertainer on the ship, and he said, would you like me to get you a pass to see the ship? And I said, well, of course. So he got me on the ship, and he walked me all around, and he took me up to where the captain stands. And I said, oh, this is great. This is a beautiful view. This is nice. And I'm standing up there, and I turn around and look, and there's an icon of St. Nicholas. Mm -hmm. I said, why is there an icon of St. Nicholas here? And he said, there's an icon of St. Nicholas in every one of these boats. I said, what? Why is that? He said, because St. Nicholas is the patron saint of seafarers. And so they always put an icon of St. Nicholas up in the boat where the, the captain is. I thought that was amazing. So anyway, so St. Nicholas is in a lot of places, including on the iconostasis. Good question. Yes, sir, Valentine. Um, for preparing the bread, why is it one or five? Why is it one or five? Yes. It's one because, Father, that they may be one as we are one, right? Uh, or it's five because Jesus multiplied the, the five loaves and two fishes. And so you know, we pray that these loaves that this blessing of uh, the Holy Communion will, will be multiplied for the world. Um, and so, in other words, it's inexhaustible. Great question. I haven't had anybody from this side yet. Nobody? Yes, sir. Uh, seeing you change the cross from side to side, is there significance in that? Yes. So this side is the resurrection. We have the resurrected Christ on this side of the cross. The other side is the crucifixion. And so usually it's on the crucifixion during the week, and then Saturday night 
when we sing, O glad some light, and the lights come up, it signifies the beginning of the day of the resurrection, and the cross turns around because Christ is resurrected. Um, and then, uh, but right now, we're in a period where, like, no Christ on the cross, right? Because we had Pascha, we had the Paschal season, and now we're in the Ascension, and so we don't have Christ on the cross. And so this cross should remain like that with the resurrection on it. Somebody had put it up on the wrong side uh, mistakenly, but that's why we turned it around, because it, it should remain uh, as the resurrected Christ until Pentecost. Good question. Catherine. Well, when does the image of Christ being crucified, when is it going to be returned to the cross? That is a great question. Um, what was the question? The great question is, when does the corpus go back on the cross? Oh. <laughs> yeah. It depends on who you ask. I asked um, one priest, and he said, well, of course. It's on the leave-taking of the Ascension. So I was so excited, I dove in the books looking for leave-taking of Ascension. I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> And so we'll, we'll put it up uh, the day after Pentecost. <laughs> Good question. Oh my goodness, they're all over the place. All right, Isaiah. Uh, hello, Pastor. I was wondering uh, who actually makes the icon and where do they come from? Great question. And can anyone make an, an icon? Great question. So the, the, the I guess we'll start from the, the end and work backwards. Uh, can anyone? make an icon, I guess the question, let's say, um, what does it take for something to be an icon, right? So the canons say that for something to be an icon, it has to be a depiction of a, uh, of a saint or of um, a person from the scriptures or of an event in the scriptures, and it has to bear their name. So it has to say, Holy Ascension. If it's just a, a painting of the Ascension, but it doesn't say, the Holy Ascension on it, then it's not technically an icon according to the canons of the church. And so um, sometimes you'll see religious art. It doesn't have the name. It's not intended to be an icon. It's just a religious depiction. Can anybody paint an icon? Yes and no. Uh, you, I've seen artists who have painted icons, right? And um, they'll do it, and it'll look just like an icon. Well, is it a real icon? It's a good question. Uh, that depends on who you ask. Um, so some people will say, well, it's not an icon until it's blessed. Uh, and I, that used to be my answer. And then I started doing a little research, and I realized that there is no ancient prayer for the blessing of an icon. <laughs> There's not even an old prayer for the blessing of an icon, really. I mean, in, in, when you think about the church being 2,000 years of iconographic history, I think the oldest prayer for the blessing of an icon that you can find is like maybe three or 400 years old. So... Uh, the, the canons don't talk about blessing icons, actually. They don't say it has to do this, this, and this, and then you have to bless it, to make it official. So it doesn't say that. So uh, we're obedient to the bishop. If the bishop says you have to bless it or it's not an icon, then that's the answer. Uh, but if the bishop doesn't tell you that, then yes, an artist can paint an icon that looks just like an icon. Now, there's a special technique to painting icons, to writing icons. So you have a lot of, pardon me, bad style icons that are out there Either they just look like religious art, but they qualify as an icon because they say the, the name of the, the, the feast or, or the, the saint or something. And then um, you've got others. There's this real popular kind of icon that came out the last few years. And they're, they're very, man, they're really beautiful. And you can see the light reflected in their eyes, uh, and like in a real painting. And of course, the problem with that is that that's not stylistically iconography because what, what, how many icons do you see up here? where there's reflections in the pupils. It's not in them, right? Because the idea of iconography is the light of Christ is shining forth from them. That's why they have the halo, or the nimbus, as it's called. So the light is coming forth from within, the light of Christ uh, that they've been baptized into. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, people can paint things that look like icons. There's a very particular iconographic style. It requires putting many different layers of paint uh, and so it, in order to bring the light forth out of the, out of the painting instead of, again, having this kind of reflection of the light look to them. Uh, and then there's the prayer and fasting that's supposed to go into the creation of icons as well. Uh, plus an iconographer, uh, it, it's, iconography is uh, it, it, it's referred to as writing icons because icons are, you've gotten all this down? He's writing it down. You're fast. I know you're fast. 
uh, iconography, we refer to the icons as being written and not painted because the icons are referred to as the gospel in color. And so whatever it is that you're depicting in that painting, that icon, is supposed to be communicating the gospel through picture. So I, think, I hope that answered everything. Where did I get these? Uh, so these were painted, written by Bara Bakmura, who was a uh, relatively well-known artist um, in various parts of the globe. And she um, became orthodox and quit doing kind of secular artwork and started doing religious artwork and then became our iconographer. And she did that back in the uh, late 80s and the early 90s. And then she, she retired from iconography at that point. But she, she painted these two for us. There's a bunch of them, Christ enthroned over here and a number of others that she did for us while she was still uh, writing icons. The rest of these are from, most of them are from, well, that's from Sharon Catherine. She's our iconographer now. She stands in the back. She is uh, she's wonderful. Um, and she's, she's done a number of them around here. And then these, uh, are from St. Isaac of Syria Skeet, which is a monastery that knows that people and churches need icons and not everybody can afford to have somebody write one for you, an original one, because it's expensive. And so uh, at one point we had money donated to get iconography for, for around the walls and things, so the icon stances. I think our time's about up, but I think Miriam has a question. Miriam? Why are you holding that cross? Why am I holding? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> You all know I'm holding this cross. I'm going to tell you. One of my favorite people in the world is Father Thomas Hopko. And Father Thomas Hopko, he's the one who we use his books for our catechism. Some of you are reading his books. Uh, I listen to his podcasts in preparation for homilies and things all the time. He's the only podcaster I really listen to. I just hard to beat. You listen to Father Thomas and you're like, what's next? I just enjoy his things very much. I used to love listening to him teach. He was the, uh, uh, the former dean of our seminary that I went to, so he came and was a guest teacher and a guest preacher and served at the liturgy, and he was just a wonderful, wonderful holy man. And when he died and went to be with Jesus, then he had some th a lot of things left over that he had accumulated during his life. And when he was invited to go over to speak at the World Council of Churches and talk about if Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy could ever get back together, what would that look like? He was invited to give a paper. And that was over in, Egypt, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And while he was there, he got this cross. It says, St. Anthony Monastery on the Red Sea. And so I've been to the Red Sea. And St. Anthony had a monastery, he had a cave up there uh, on a mountainside. And so when he died, then Father Seraphim Mosliner was at the monastery where Father Hopko served all the time, and where he lived, he lived next door to the monastery. And one of the nuns said, Father Seraphim, would you like this cross? It belonged to Father Thomas Hopko. And he said, I would love to have that cross, thank you. And so Father Seraphim, moved to Bloomington. And when he came here, he said, I know how you love Father Thomas Hopko, so I'd like to give you his cross. So that's why I hold it, because I love my dear friend. Uh, I wish we were closer, we're not. We certainly weren't very close in age. But Father Thomas Hopko, he's a dear brother and father in Christ. So I love holding on to the cross of Christ and also uh, a, a secondary relic of Father Thomas Hopko. So that's why. I think we're out of time. Is this real? Is this Better be urgent. This is urgent. But yeah. Mine's urgent. Hold on. Yeah. Was the question about icons just a, a flat can anybody write an icon? That was that was one fourth of the question, yes. <laughs> okay. It was a long question. It was a good question, multi layered. Okay. But you talked about the danger of not having a blessing to, in painting an icon. I did not cover that. I didn't talk about the word danger. Well, here's, may I say one thing? You may. Because I walked in in the middle of the answer. Yes. So I'm sorry. No. That. She's not, I'm, she's not counting on the clock now, because she's, she's answering at her own clock. Just one quick second. So, it does happen sometimes that even... Just could you please watch me? Okay, let's listen to Mom's answer first. 
My question, well, it's more of a, um, so um, there are sometimes pretty significant errors that will take place when somebody is um, painting or writing an icon. Um, uh, occasionally, there will be an error with a halo, with the icon of the Mother of God or with the Lord. Occasionally, um, someone will very erroneously depict God the Father or try to depict God the Father. Um, occasionally, um, some uh, artistic element will affect the production of the icon that actually um, doesn't support the theology of whatever is supposed to be conveyed or is what is intended to be conveyed. So if this is redundant, I apologize. But when learning about iconography, especially for the artistically inclined, um, or when baking um, holy bread, for those who love to do that, um, that type of, perform that type of service, even though these are very common practices, I mean, I would ask a blessing. It, it's always a good idea because if, for several reasons, um, it's good to have a blessing for common things that are intended to be used by the church, things that are common. Um, it's important um, for us to um, get into the habit of having small obediences, like maybe yes, but not yet. Also, when you have a blessing to um, practice iconography or um, be serving by making holy bread, just a second, then someone else knows that you're doing that. And so if there's a point where there needs to be some guidance or correction along the way, in my view, it's much safer to be doing that with the knowledge of a priest or a mother confessor because um, if you need coaching, then somebody else is available to do that. Otherwise, I have looked for icons online in the past um, or come across um, biographies of iconographers that are either fairly secular in their approach or they kind of discovered iconography as another genre or not, um, in their artistic career. And so they may produce icons or um, art that looks very similar to icons, but they may not even necessarily be Christian, never mind Orthodox, never mind um, have a theological background to support the creating of that icon, never mind a stable relationship with a father confessor. So I just wanted to say that. Um, and Sharon Catherine, one time when she was um, teaching in the evening, just one second, just gave a beautiful, simple, um, personal statement as to how um, seriously she felt as an iconographer personally about having the blessing to practice that in service of the church. Um, and she made a wonderful, she really made a wonderful case for it and uh, got me thinking a great deal. She said, this is not an art form where I would feel that it is proper or safe to be freelancing. And so even she, an iconographer herself, um, you know, understands that it's important to be doing that as part of a relationship with the church and with a pastor. Is that Beautiful. okay to say? Thank you. That was not redundant at all. Okay. All right. So the bottom line is ask a blessing. Works. All right, last one, and then we're going to. Charles is telling me we're out of time. No, I'm telling you, I want your question. Oh, to what's your question? Uh, what's a cannon? What's a cannon? <laughs> what a great question. Okay. So, cannon is sometimes referred to, cannons are sometimes referred to as canon law. Canon law which makes it sound like there's a whole bunch of laws in the church, and if you break them, you're going to go to hell. Right? That's kind of what it sounds like. Canon law. The church has decided this, and it's the law, and if you break the law, you're in huge trouble. Uh, but canon, I, I do not refer to canon law, because the word Torah, which is, uh, which is often translated as law, uh, is, is actually instruction. So the canons are made to instruct us in the ways of salvation. Right? The canons are made to instruct us on uh, 
doing the will of God uh, on how the church is supposed to function as the hospital of humanity, you know, so that people's sick souls can be cured. And so the canons are a list of things that the, that the saints of the church and the, the councils of the church have come up with that the church as a whole has decided these are normative, regular things that we agree are necessary for us in our spiritual life. If the church is going to function properly and people are going to have good spiritual health and they're going to be doing the will of God, they should be doing these things. Those are what canons are. Am I bouncing my, am I talking with my hands again? Thank you for pointing that out. You're a big helper. All right, I'm going to bring you with me everywhere. Okay, so that's time. Uh, God bless all of you. Thank you so much for your patience. And uh, let us go forth in peace. You don't get a blessing tonight. It's just